Well, officials of NASA will be in Southern Nevada tomorrow for an announcement that could make international news. They'll be at the North Las Vegas plant of Bigelow Aerospace. The 10 year old local company is on the cutting edge of efforts to promote private enterprise in space. Bigelow is about to invest in a major expansion that will mean up to 1,200 new jobs over the next year. George Knapp of the I-Team got an exclusive look inside the Bigelow operation. You're here with an update. And of course, as you know, we've been in the plant a couple yes. of times and we had the only camera present for its two space launches, but what's unfolding now is the most significant development since the company was launched. The dream of private enterprise in space is no longer a futuristic hope. It's here. Southern Nevada finds itself at the center of a brand new industry that will generate hundreds of good jobs and could literally change the world. More than a few doubts were raised back when the signs went up at Warp Drive and Skywalker Way, and again when Bob Bigelow spoke of hotels in space for the ultimate vacation. But after two successful launches of Bigelow's homegrown Genesis spacecraft, the aerospace industry isn't laughing anymore. We're bound to mess up or screw up a little bit of this or that. And now Bigelow is briskly moving into new territory. This 185,000 square foot addition to his plant in North Las Vegas represents the birth of a global industry right in our backyard. It's way beyond R&D. It's a production facility for spacecraft, a factory for building habitats for use on the moon or Mars or beyond. The only purpose this addition has is for production. And we have three spacecraft, so we essentially will have three production lines, an assembly, you know, like an assembly plant you would normally have. Bigelow expects the plant to be open for business by this time next year. It means his lean workforce of 115 would expand by an additional 1,200 new positions, engineers, technicians, and support staff. It is exactly the kind of economic diversification Nevada leaders say they yearn for. We kind of keep a little quiet and it has huge potential. In more ways than one. Starting just over 10 years ago, Bigelow committed 500 million of his own dollars. He licensed a canceled NASA project called TransHab, added 14 or so of his own patents, and created a much improved expandable habitat that essentially means more space in space. One was launched in 2006, another in 2007, and they're still up there. And both vehicles have been uh, performing flawlessly in terms of their pressure maintenance, their thermal control, uh, as well as their environmental containment scenarios. So we're, we're real pleased with the performance. So pleased the company skipped right over an interim craft to go for the gusto. Three different designs that each offer much more than the cramped modules that make up the International Space Station. This would be three times the volume as the average module on station on ISS. So what is the plan? Would you have these up there by themselves or they would just be components of a, of a space station or a series of space stations? That could fly by itself. These are totally self-contained space, uh, habitable uh, spacecraft. The company has come so far so fast in part by keeping things simple, sometimes relying on off-the-shelf components. There are no technical barriers remaining. That are flight ready and qualified and ready to bolt on so, as soon as we're ready so, to have a structure to bolt it to. Bigelow uses these intricate models as part of the sales pitch to foreign governments or corporations, anyone interested in leasing one or more of the modules. Seven countries have already signed on, including the UK, Japan, and Australia, meaning they can put their own astronauts into space without paying for an entire space program from scratch. But this is outfitted uh, to uh, support six people and the, and the living quarters and crew quarters are in this area. The plant also has full-scale mock-ups and the biggest difference between these and what's up there now is elbow room. How important is that for a long-term mission? Just ask the Bigelow employee who's been to the ISS as the pilot of a space shuttle mission. It's nice to have privacy, you know, on the shuttle, yeah, we had a communal living all in the mid-deck. Um, Sometimes, you know, I spend a night on the space station just to get away, you know, <laughs> so this is the chance for everybody to get away when they want to, you know, spend, you know, for these long duration missions, you're going to have to have some personal time. 
So how much would it cost to lease one of the Bigelow modules? They have a very detailed price list and a sophisticated pitch about why a country or a company would want to boldly go to this new frontier. Tomorrow at 11, we'll talk about cost, in case you want to start saving your pennies <laughs> now. And we'll have a look at a new proposed moon base. And we'll be there tomorrow for the NASA announcement, which we think will give Bob Bigelow a piece of the International Space Station. Fantastic. Um, unbelievable. Of yeah. course it would happen here. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you, George. Sure. The deputy administrator of NASA came to the Valley today to take a fresh look at Bigelow Aerospace. The local company is building a line of spacecraft that could eventually be used on the moon, even Mars. And the NASA officials stopped short of announcing a deal to attach a Bigelow spacecraft to the International Space Station, though that agreement is likely to be reached in the next few months. But who will pay hundreds of millions of dollars to get to space, and what will they do when they get there? The I Team's George Knapp has an inside look at the Bigelow business plan. Dave, let's say you're Canada. You, you don't mind <laughs> right. that, do you? No, no. Let's say you're Canada, you spend $300 million a year on your space program, but that amount will get you a single astronaut visit to the space station over a five-year period. By leasing space on one of Bigelow's private space facilities, Canada could, have, Canada could have five astronauts in space for about half as much money. A third world country that wants to keep its best science students from leaving the country might be able to transform its national image by having an astronaut corps without paying for an entire space program. That's basically how it would work. Of having visitors and having people uh, come to the moon, that would be the, the destination of all time. There'd be more than a few politicians and, and rich folks that would want to do that. I mean, And the rest of us as well. The idea of a zero-gravity resort on the surface of the moon isn't far-fetched at all, certainly not to Bob Bigelow. When he launched his private space program a decade ago, the assumption was he wanted to duplicate the success of his earthly hotel chain out there. And while Bigelow is convinced tourism will help drive the commercialization of space. He never intended to run any hotels himself. Bigelow Aerospace is more of a contractor. It will build and lease expandable space habitats as standalone modules in orbit or craft combined into space stations like Station Bravo, capable of housing a crew of 24, or as the backbone of permanent bases on the moon or Mars, surfaced by stations orbiting above. There's no reason that you couldn't have multiples, multiple bases. Other private parties in the space race like Richard Branson or Space One have much higher profiles than Bigelow. This one is designed to accommodate three people. But the Nevada company is much further along and has far bigger goals than quickie up-down jaunts into the wild blue. The Bigelow modules represent a more permanent presence in space, though Bigelow says he and the other space entrepreneurs are all taking steps down the same road. The suborbital folks uh, have a, a little different mission, but it leads right into the orbital activity. The suborbital is, is a great place uh, uh, for, uh, like the FAA, uh, to supervise that and get used to frequent uh, flights and, and for the general public to be able to have access to something that will go 2,500 miles an hour up to 100 kilometers. That's pretty exciting. Other than transportation, meaning rockets reliable enough to get the modules into space, Falcon 9 has cleared the tower. The main challenge is making it profitable. Bigelow thinks corporations would lease out a module or entire station, slap their brand on the exterior like a company naming a sports stadium for research or for bragging rights. He's already reached tentative deals with seven countries based on specific prices outlined in his leasing guide. It would not be cheap, for instance, to lease a Sundancer craft for a year, roughly a few hundred million dollars, but would still be a bargain compared to starting a complete space program. The ISS, for instance, cost the U.S. more than a hundred billion dollars. Bigelow says he could build a much larger and safer station for a fraction of that cost, and it turns out his first customer will likely be NASA, whose deputy administrator confirmed that a Bigelow module could soon be added to the ISS. Former space shuttle pilot Bill O'Flein has been to the space station, but is now working for Bigelow. It's, it's very exciting. The commercial space industry, as you know, is, is just taken off, literally, and uh, to be a part of it is, is really exciting. But still, what would you do out there? Other than the view, why go? There are practical and profitable reasons to be on the moon, Bigelow says. Deep space observatories, valuable resources to tap, such as helium-3, exploiting lunar ice deposits to make rocket fuel, which could be burned in thrusters like the one developed by his team. 
They've got the flag up now, and you can see the stars and stripes. From and there's the prestige factor. The U.S. has coasted on its moon landing laurels for 40 years, Bigelow says. Now, with NASA facing cuts, someone else will likely lay claim to the moon. Next time we get to the moon, will probably be greeted by the Chinese. The best way to compete in space, Bigelow says, is for NASA to offer support, then get out of the way to let private and, companies um, build and expand awesome. as this Nevada company is doing, and then see where it leads. If you had two identical societies, you had Earth over here and Earth 2 over here, and but the first Earth folks only knew terrestrial activities, and that's all that they ever know. But the other folks over here have robust microgravity research labs, as well as all the terrestrial facilities. Where would you put your money as to which group of folks are going to eventually advance the most? You'd have to say it costs 20 million per launch paid to the Russians to get Bigelow's first two spacecraft into orbit. But the Russians kept jacking up the price, so the company is now waiting for American launch companies to get up to speed. When that happens, hopefully within two years, Bigelow will add up to 1,500 new jobs at his North Las Vegas mm -hmm. plant, and a new global industry will be off and running right here in our backyard. So he won't tackle the launch part. He's yeah, I think he's cooperating with the launch mm, people and, and, yeah. uh, and helping them any way he can, but he's strictly into putting stuff up, up there, there for yeah. space. Fascinating, George. Sure. Thank you. Sure. Thanks, George.